Two decades ago, the Soviet Union collapsed and the Cold War ended. Communism was declared dead. And many of you will remember that on November 9th, 2009, Europe threw a huge party at the Brandenburg Gate. World leaders were there, including uh, Nicolas Sarkozy, Hillary Clinton, Mikhail Gorbachev. And uh, there were fireworks, and 1,000 huge dominoes were knocked down to celebrate the fall of the Berlin Wall 20 years ago. On that very same day, I was in a dusty Chinese mountain town known as Yan'an. And there I watched as young Chinese actors wearing historical uniforms reenacted a battle between Maoist revolutionaries and the Kuomintang. In this display, it was the communist forces who were victorious. Here, a world apart from the events in Berlin, the birth of communism was being celebrated, not its death. For the past seven years, I've been exploring this world apart with my camera. <clears throat> and it turns out that the areas of our planet which are under Communist Party rule and where the Communist Party has managed to survive and adapt to the 21st century are far more vast and varied than most of us imagine. Let's put it in numbers. Since the end of the Cold War, seven countries across three continents, the Communist Party has managed to hold on to power. That's a total population of 1.47 billion people, with a majority living in China. Or to put it another way, one in five people currently on this planet live under Communist Party rule. And when I wanted to take pictures of Maoist revolutionaries during the 21st century, I didn't have to settle for a historical reenactment. In Nepal, communist rebels following Mao Zedong's playbook led a bloody revolution uh, against Nepal's monarchy, which they toppled in 2008. 13,000 people were killed in this brutal civil war between the Maoists and the Royal Nepal Army. And much of the fighting uh, follows sort of a cruel pattern of cat and mouse attacks, which took place in rural villages. Thousands of people were disappeared in the middle of the night. And it was really the civilian population who bore the brunt of the violence. Take the example of this man, whose name is Sundar Chaudhari. He was born a slave, and for the first 30 years of his life, he was a slave. Like his father and his grandfather, and, and like one of the other speakers here at this conference, Urmila Chaudhari, uh, he was born indentured to a high caste landlord, and he was forced to work 18-hour days. And eventually, after years of pressure, Nepal's government uh, acted to ban forced labor, bonded debt labor, and Chaudhary and thousands of other families were freed. He was able to start a normal life. He built a small thatched roof home for his family, and he began to work his own land. Then in the middle of the night, Maoist rebels came and planted a communist flag on his land. Early in the morning, a patrol of Royal Nepal army troops came by and demanded that he take out the flag. The flagpole was rigged to a mine, and it exploded in his face. For the Maoist, Nepal's horribly unjust pecking order was a call to arms. Yet many times their tactics, which included using forced labor to build roads or conscripting child soldiers, were as harmful as the injustices that they were fighting against. Time and again, amongst these communist regimes that I visited, they revealed that their original pursuit for equality could be abandoned or maintained as a mere facade, leaving power and the pursuit of power as an end in itself. And we should never forget the consequences of totalitarian power. Experts estimate that 20th century communist dictators, including Mao, Stalin, and Pol Pot, killed over 85 million people with a legacy of gulags and famines and purges. North Korea's Kim dynasty has carried forward that ideology and its devastating consequences into the 21st century. And chillingly, North Korea has managed to do this behind a veil of total secrecy. You know, when, when famine struck the Horn of Africa, our media was filled with images of hungry people and, and appeals from aid organizations. Yet when a million people were killed in North Korea, no images made it to the outside world. And Korean officials kept aid organizations at arm's length. In addition to that, 
North Korea has managed to hide from the world a vast system of forced labor camps, which are estimated to hold upwards of 200,000 people. And not only do they hide their human rights abuses from the rest of the world, but they inundate their own population with hate-filled, xenophobic propaganda. And they, they paint a godlike image of their leaders. The result of all this is a paranoid society where neighbors and family members are encouraged to spy and snitch on each other to prove their loyalty. There's a lack of individualism. There's a massive cult of personality. And by keeping people in the dark about the true nature of totalitarian communist rule, the ideology has maintained an uncanny popularity over the years. Artists, Uh, compassionate intellectuals and normal people have cheered on the Communist Party. People ranging from Pablo Picasso to Charlie Chaplin, Jean-Paul Sartre to Ernest Hemingway. Many people who have been exploited by capitalism have a hard time imagining or remembering that another system could be worse. Take, for example, Moldova. In 2001, voters, including women like this one in the picture, democratically elected the Communist Party back in power in the former Soviet Republic of Moldova. Moldova is a small, landlocked country uh, which borders the European Union, and for years it had struggled in the volatile world of global capitalism. And nostalgia for the stability and the superpower status of the Soviet Union ran high. And this spell lasted all the way until April 2009, when there was another batch of elections, and the Communist Party won again but this time they were accused of electoral fraud. And students stormed the parliament in disgust, and they burned symbols of the Communist Party. Eventually, fresh elections were held again, and a coalition of pro-European Union parties were elected, and they hold power today. Cuba is also nostalgic for this previous era of Soviet power, and they remain doggedly attached to the centrally planned economic model of the Soviet Union. Now, despite the fact that this economic model has had a disastrous performance record everywhere else in the world, the Cuban regime uses the long-running stubborn U.S. embargo as the ideal pretext to deflect any and all criticism and scrutiny from Communist Party policies. But the model that is far more common today is a new breed of state-backed capitalism which was perfected in China and adopted in Laos and Vietnam. Communist Party officials and big businesses work together hand in glove. So these countries have joined the free market, but not in a way that was predicted. The CEOs of all of China's big companies and strategic sectors are members of the Communist Party, handpicked for their party loyalty. These businesses, which are boosted by authoritarian steroids, perform very well on the global stage, often with the participation of foreign investors. But back home, the inequalities and the damaging aspects of capitalism now flourish. When people criticize mining projects, pollution, or unfair working conditions, they're often treated in the same harsh manner by authorities as political dissidents. And nowhere is that as true as in Laos. Laos opened up their first stock market, which you can see in the background here, in the beginning of last year. And there's a string of glitzy new casinos near the banks of the Mekong River. But deep in the jungles of Laos, it's as if the Cold War never ended. There, ethnic Hmong people are living in hiding, constantly in fear of attacks by the Lao People's Army. Why? Because the Hmong collaborated with the first the French and then the American forces during the Vietnam War. When the U.S. was defeated and the Communist forces took over Laos in 1975, they continued hunting the Hmong. And it's a practice that endures to this day. Now, the Hmong eke out their existence in the jungle by scavenging for roots. They move their makeshift camps every few weeks to avoid detection. And when they're discovered by army patrols, it's often the weakest and the slowest who are gunned down before they can flee into the brush. For these ethnic Hmong, who still live in the crosshairs of a communist regime, it would never cross their minds to tell you that communism is dead.